Well, certainly Brexit was something of a political revolution. Britain's unwritten constitution is based upon parliamentary sovereignty, wherein Parliament has the right to make or unmake any law, and whereby no person or body has the right to override or set aside the legislation of Parliament. But, when the British public voted by 51.9% to leave the EU, influential politicians and pundits claimed that the non-binding referendum result was an expression of the popular will. The government, they argued, was bound to legislate on this popular will, even over and against the sovereignty of Parliament. During the first Conservative Party conference following the referendum, new Prime Minister Theresa May commanded her government to respect what the people told us on the 23rd of June and take Britain out of the European Union. When in November, the High Court of Justice ruled that Parliament had to legislate on Brexit, the Daily Mail accused the judiciary of being enemies of the people. Meanwhile, Nigel Farage of UKIP warned that 100,000 strong people's army would march on the Supreme Court. In describing at the beginning of last year, 2017, this time last year, what she envisaged to be Britain's post-EU shared society, Theresa May explicitly placed the ordinary working class as its prime deserving constituency. The popular will apparently emanated from the ordinary working class. What counts as ordinary? To answer this, we need to go back to the last years of the Labour government and the economic fallout from the global financial crisis. In 2008, a set of programmes broadcast on the BBC under the title White Season. These programmes controversially gave voice to a sense of unfairness amongst self-identifying white members of the working class. They argued that Britain's black and minority ethnic populations now enjoyed positive discrimination in law and welfare provision while they, the indigenous, were being forgotten and left behind by the neoliberal economy. By 2010, the Labour government began to get worried about their base of support. Hazel Blair's then community secretary acknowledged that lower income white people felt that their acute fears over immigration had been ignored. Well, Labour indeed lost the election Year, but the theme of the white forgotten, the left behind, persisted in the governments that followed. For instance, in 2013, David Willits, then Universities Minister, suggested that when it came to higher education, white working class boys should be targeted in the same way as other disadvantaged groups were by the Office for Fair Access. In February 2016, the Spectator newspaper took issue with an article written by David Cameron which drew attention to the relative paucity of black and minority ethnic students in prestigious universities. Here's what the spectator says. But he's wrong about the ethnicity of those students and wrong about where the problem lies. It's working class white boys who fare the worst, not black boys. So here's the thing. In the years preceding the global financial crisis, class was rarely spoken or legislated on directly in Britain. Rather, issues to do with class, especially inequality, were dealt with through proxy concepts, especially social exclusion. So what a contrast to the last eight years or so. The point I'm making is that in Britain, class and concern for class inequality has returned to public discourse as a constitutively racialised category as the white working class. The ordinary working class that Theresa May says is now deserving of social justice is racialised, it's white. Now in what follows, I'm going to argue that the making and remaking of this deserving constituency, the white working class, has a colonial genealogy. Here's another thing. Over the last decade, it's as if politicians and pundits have just discovered this mainly northern, native tribe, the white working class, who've been ignored for decades. But if you go back, throughout the 20th century, black radicals, communists, plenty others, from South Africa to Rhodesia to the USA, even to the UK, plenty people were using the term white working class. 
They were doing so, though, not to refer to an indigenous constituency of Northern England, but to talk about a racialized division of labor created by empire and preserved in post-colonial Britain. Here's a Pan-Africanist, Cecil Gutsmore, in 1973, commenting on a strike in Southgate where black workers were not supported by their white comrades in, in Britain. The white working class tend to be more or less willing agents of the ruling class in regards to blacks, which is precisely why one section of the working class finds it necessary to use industrial action against another. It seems like contemporary politicians and pundits have chosen not to remember this longer genealogy of the white working class. That's convenient. So I'm going to argue that the white working class were made into a constituency through the racialization of an abiding moral distinction between the deserving versus the undeserving poor. That's my key point. The white working class were made into a constituency through the racialization of the distinction between deserving and undeserving poor. But to be really clear, this constituency has rarely been self-authored, self-empowered, or self-directed. Rather, this constituency is fundamentally an artifact of political domination. Now, what follows, I'm going to selectively chart the shifting of these racialized distinctions across imperial time and space. How the deserving and the undeserving poor are made and remade from the abolition of slavery to the high point of 19th century empire to the creation of the welfare state and Commonwealth Britain and finally to Brexit. Will we get through it? I don't know. <laughs> Let's just see. I'm also going to place particular focus on blackness as a criterion of undeservedness and ultimately whiteness as a criterion of deservedness and you'll see you'll see why I used to have a much smaller laptop than this. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much better on my arm. Anyway the deserving poor it's a Christian idea legislated through the Elizabethan poor laws there, the deserving poor are identified as industrious, prudent, thrifty, respectful of private property and its inheritance through the patriarchal order. The men are small patriarchs, the women obedient wives and mothers, and the men live independently, these deserving poor, but in an orderly fashion. The undeserving, they're unchristian, idle, dependent, contiguous. Mercurial, irresponsible fathers, husbands, mothers, wives, disorderly. By the, ninth, by the 1770s, the distinction between the deserving and undeserving has come to be articulated through African enslavement. The Caribbean slave, considered by slaveholders, English travellers, commentators and politicians, considered unable to exercise proprietary sensibilities. After all, he's property himself. Unable to be a small patriarch, a chain in the patriarchal order. How can he be? He's not his own man. He's a property of another. The slave, idle and this whipped, irrational and this directed by master, yet dangerously anarchical. In short, the slave is made to possess all the attributes of the undeserving poor. White abolition is first and foremost concerned with getting rid of these undeserving attributes and turning slaves into deserving workers. Abolition is not interested in freedom. Take for instance the first concrete emancipation scheme for the English colonies written in 1765 and published anonymously in 1772. It suggests that young African boys could be taken from trading forts on the African continent Instructed in England, then sent to North America, where they would there train emancipated, emancipated Africans in the spirit of industry and achievement, so that those emancipated Africans would be cheaper labour than the enslaved. But what if abolition were to be pushed forwards by the enslaved themselves? 
absent the preparation and supervision prescribed by white abolitionists. That's the challenge met by the Haitian Revolution. Many commentators in England see this revolution, a revolution authored by the enslaved themselves, as an explosion of anarchy, worse than even the French Revolution that's going on just across the Channel. Take, for instance, the opinion of Henry Brougham, future Lord Chancellor during the 1832 Slavery Abolition Act, arguing that filial submission is the root of political order and that slaves are capable of no such thing. Brougham believes that the tribes of San Domingo would be capable of governing only through the caprice and violence of the human passions. Brougham worries that enslaved Africans in British colonies might learn from the example of Haiti. Hence, African barbarism might spread over the fairest portions of the New World. 